God, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, all those reading through these different books of Scripture. Uh, bless our time together, the observations, questions, uh, things that jump off the pages and speak to us uh, as we read this uh, treasure book of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. That's okay. Okay. So just, just like an overview, we're now in the fourth book of the Torah. Torah as a whole means instructions, uh, or four instructions. And uh, as I was reading about uh, some, some Jewish perspective on the book of Numbers, um, it, I found a neat piece that talked about the five books of Torah as instruction for life. And so if you go from Genesis, uh, this is just something I wanted to start off with, represents the early years. Uh, are lessons that learned in family or close-knit family familial groups and you see a lot of that with Jacob and Esau and you know what not to do what to do experiences of conflict jealousy impulsiveness that we gradually give way to maturity humility the ability to seek or offer forgiveness at the end of this youthful period we venture out of our earliest homes okay so that's kind of a rabbinical look at Genesis then Exodus finding your name a young adult stage experiencing ambivalence about who we are and what we want to be. Do we want freedom or not? Do we believe they have the strength to succeed or not? Do we connect with God or not? And are we grateful for the blessings we have received or not? Towards the end of this stage, ambivalence is overcome, a house is built, and the peace of God dwells within us. Okay. Leviticus, I bet you're wondering, what is Leviticus? God calls. We have mastered many of the rituals and routines of adult life, learning how to support others in sorrow, joy, through healing journeys, and through practical problems. Through our own ups and downs, we learn the value of loving your neighbor as yourself and observe the blessings that flow from this love and the curses that spread in its absence. And today for numbers, wandering in the wilderness. Life is good. Inner tribes are in order. Your inner gifts, I feel like this is a horoscope. Your inner, <laughs> your inner gifts are flowing. You know your true inner name, but suddenly you may have a dramatic change in health or family or work, and all the chaos of early childhood comes up again. So you would, you would love to find your way out of this land uh, of this chaos to a land flowing with milk and honey, but you need courage, leadership, and calm. Parts of yourself that have been suppressed may begin to speak, and you may find psychic room for it. Does feel like a yeah. for a greater, more complex self? Or at least it's written by a psychologist. Yeah, maybe so. Rabbi, maybe so. Yeah. <laughs> and then the last, the last is Deuteronomy. Yeah. Uh, Deuteronomy is a life in review, affirming some of the principles you live by and revisiting your memories, imagining the world, the future filled with challenges for your students, children, and younger friends, passing on your wisdom. You have met God in your deepest self, face to face, interior to interior, and you have grown. So anyway, a rabbi's take on the Torah as a whole. Hi, Jennifer. Come on in. All right. <clears throat> So, um, from notes on Numbers, you see that there's two different, there's an English name for the book of Numbers that comes from the counting. That's why I put the little count in the, uh, <laughs> so you have the census taking uh, twice, counting the fighting men of the tribes and counting the heads of households. Um, and there's a lot of exact numbering of who's, who's contributing what, whether it's to the warrior class of Israel as they go in with, make no mistake though, it's God that's leading this army. And then they're going to provide willing soldiers. Uh, and then we also see it in the dedication of uh, the blessing of the families. Each head of the household is giving, you know, 
a silver plate weighing 35 shekels or, you know, all these lambs and the counting and they're all a zat, right? Everybody's giving generously the same things. Because I t checked to see, just does anybody kind of shirk and know they're yeah. giving? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it, it, the English name comes with this counting or the idea of the censuses. But the Hebrew name is in the, wild, in the wilderness. Um, so one is um, talking more about, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting because one talks about the chaos and uncertainty of being in a wilderness time and needing to trust God. And the other is talking, the, the numbers are more about um, obedience back to God, but we're going to, what we're bringing to the table. It's a different emphasis on what, like in the Catholic Church versus the Protestant Church, you have a crucifix with Christ on it versus an empty cross. Same event of crucifixion, but we're emphasizing different weight on different parts of that crucifixion. So I, I see that as the same kind of thing with the book of Numbers. All right, so just a little overview. Um, and I did want to start in kind of a Pastor Michelle fashion with, a, I know she does a lot of poems. Uh, but this is uh, fantastic, and uh, by Rabbi Dorothy Rickman, and uh, I'm going to share this with you. This God did not lead us by the inner way when Pharaoh let the people go at last, but roundabout by way of the wilderness. Pillars of fire and cloud making night and day to the edge of the flood tide uncrossable and vast. If God had led us by the nearer way, we cried, we would not die here. Let Egypt oppress us as it will. Let us return to the past. But God did not lead us by the nearer way, but into rising waters which did not part unless with outstretched arms we step forward and stand fast. Um, I would summarize that by saying the journey matters. We needed to take this long journey with God to find ourselves before we could accept the promise. So, um, all right, so let's start off with just a little free-for-all of how did you find the book of Numbers? What were your initial reactions to it as you took it to a whole? Uh, some things that you were feeling as you read through this biblical book. Rosemary, yeah. Well, the first uh, part what I felt was really, um, I hate to say it, redundant. But then you just, you just cleared it up. It was instructions for the different <coughs> groups and I was like okay that helps me out they were giving being given and I think it even said it but just I kept thinking man this is really redundant and then it was the, yeah. for me it was just pronouncing some of their names because I was like <laughs> I'm still working on their names and trying to yeah why couldn't they be like John Paul George <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a lot of so but um yeah that's what I I just but now I get it yeah, you don't know, meet a lot of Shalumiels or <laughs> Zerudadai. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Uh, other other thoughts, other things that jumped, or the reactions that you had when you're reading numbers? Well, I, I liked all the quirkiness of the, you know, the red heifer and the, the adulterous woman. And There's a lot of quirkiness in there, isn't there? There's a lot of obscure kind of laws and traditions in numbers, yeah. Yeah. That you'll find nowhere else in Scripture. Mm. All right. Anyone? Are you also saying that it gets easier after now that we're done with numbers to get it? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Oh, thanks. Different. It gets different. It gets okay, different. Fine. Well, I've got the book now. I've got the study. Well, let's, um, let's talk about, um, you know, so literally, if, if again, if you're taking Numbers as a historical book, like this is a play-by-play -play of what Israel did, if you really look at Numbers, the order of events are actually out of order. Mm -hmm. This counting that starts in Genesis, uh, Numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 actually happens in terms of the action more closely to uh, Numbers 11 and 12 when they're getting ready to enter into the land of promise and to attack, but they're wandering a lot of time before that happens. 
Uh, it really covers 38 of the 40 years, but not all 40. Um, and so it, it's not really helpful. To th I, I don't find it really helpful to try to historically link it to a specific 40-year process, and I'm going to go from A to B to C to D, because that's not how the book is ordered in itself. It's talking about organization and preparation, uh, disobedient, or this is disobedience to God, or are you going to obey and, and trust in God in this wilderness of your life, or are you going to rebel against God and have your own way and be stubborn? And so in that way, the book of Numbers is pretty human to anybody um, because I would ask, uh, how many of you felt at some point in time, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you felt like you've been kind of adrift at some point in your life, or you lost your way, or been in a wilderness time in your life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, a lot of, the, the literal, uh, I think I put it in the notes out to you, it would take, what was it, uh, by foot, yeah. uh, what, map, map quest by foot, uh, was a couple of, what was it, a month? Uh, where did I put it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a week. A week. You could make this trek on foot in a week if you just A, Egypt to B, uh, you know, Jordan. Um, did it stop to ask for directions? But <laughs> Moses was definitely a man, all right? He didn't stop to ask for directions. Yes, he got lost. We're lost! I'm not stopping. <laughs> no, um... And, uh, yeah, so there's also a question about if it's a literal 40 years or is that 40 is a very biblical number. It's a, you know, you hear 40 days, 40 nights with the flood. You hear Jesus 40 days, 40 nights out in the wilderness tested by Satan. Um, there's a lot around the book of uh, 40 days that Moses spends up listening to God for the commandments for the first time. Uh, there's three different times that Moses is given the commandments. Sometimes he's with the 70, sometimes he's by himself, sometimes it's him and Aaron. Anyway, um, but yeah, 40 is a, a, a view of completion or fullness or a biblical time period. So, um, but yeah, we have this, this journey into, um, into this land of promise. Now, we have... Uh, Let's get to our questions a little bit. Um, how difficult is it to trust God when you're faced with something unknown in your future? And I'm asking this of you today. How, how difficult yeah. do you find it? Really, really hard. And really what hard. makes it difficult, do you think, for you? you know, what makes it? I need a little concrete knowing this or this or this, <laughs> but that's going to happen. I'm, I'm very bad at that. I can't, I can't, I know I can't. I said I couldn't be Jewish because I couldn't just be a Jewish guy. I I need Jesus. I, I got something concrete. I so you, so you need that incarnational piece. Yes. Of Christ in the flesh, uh, God in the flesh. Right. It's a little too shaky for you. Uh, if you're, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, so these people had a lot of a lot of physical things, and I was like. Whoa. Come on, people! You've seen all these <laughs> miracles, and you just yeah. keep, yet they're doubted and <laughs> disobedient. It's right. Really disobedient. I, it was yeah. just yeah. like it's kind of amazing to think that you see all the stuff happening, and you still you don't trust. And, and I think what I oh, what I mean, I put myself in that situation, but I do the same thing. But I join with the rest. Mm -hmm. oh, join with the rest. That's key. I think. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Follow, follow, yeah. Follow. complaining about something everybody else. Is yeah, because you get to that part with Achan's rebellion, or um, and they're like, "Well, Moses, we're not there, and we've spent a couple of years out here, mm -hmm. and there's no water. <laughs> you know, there's no meat." It all up Your leadership is sketchy. <laughs> yeah. So what? Yeah. There's all these rules, and we're still not there, and so there's a lack of confidence in leadership, right? And so yeah, you, uh, the question is, I mean, we say, oh yeah, well we would we would be faithful. Well, when you're you know day in and day out, and you know this is what you're promised, and it's not happening, and vote of confidence. Fire there every day. Right, right, yeah. I think, right. I mean, to look at their 
their situation is different than what we feel. I think when, when you are desperate for something, or it's a habit or something, and you know you put your faith in the Lord, but you also know that even though you're desperate, this might not happen. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. Yeah. But yeah. you don't know if you're hearing God or not. I, I think the discernment is a really tough thing to do. <coughs> Whereas in these little rules that they were having, there was no question as to what was right and what was wrong for them to do. I, I kept thinking of if if I can trust you with the little things, then I can trust you with the big things, you know, mm -hmm. what God is saying to them. But God was just much more verbal then, if that could be said. I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but... We don't have today as many, at least I don't, as, as many, as much of a roadmap as, mm. as what the written part of numbers seems to be. You, know, you do this, this, and this, and this is what will happen. Um, but that's never happened to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anybody else want to weigh in on this before we uh, flesh that out a little bit? I mean, did it, does it surprise you? Uh, what was your reaction when the people say on multiple occasions, oh, if we were just back in Egypt? Yeah. yeah. Well, so much easier then. They knew what was going to happen. Now I want you to, as we say that, yeah. So, so, they, so I want you to think about a time when either you or a family member was in a bad situation, whether it's a work situation, a bad relationship. And you want to tell the person or yourself, you know instinctively, you need to make a change. You got to step out and leave this situation, leave this job, leave this <laughs> this thing that's got you stuck. But the human tendency is the devil I know. All right, you were slaves. You were miserable. You were crying out to God. Your children were being killed um, by Pharaoh because he didn't was worried about the power dynamics, and yet. You want to go back to the known because you're afraid to step out and trust God in the unknown. I think that's really... And then you get the report of the spies. Well, these people are giants. We got no shot. Uh, let's be practical here. And okay. So there's a lot of times in Numbers where God says, do you trust me? And the people say, what do the Numbers tell us? <laughs> you know, what's the... What is the market saying? What are, you know? What are, what have we got? What are our fighting men? What are our numbers? <coughs> and God says, "I'm leading you, or am I not leading you?" And that's going to come up as a question later in Joshua and Judges, and further on we go. But that's really a strong theme in the Book of Numbers. All right. Um, after reading the first four books of Torah, do you think they're all written by Moses? or maybe some combination, and what evidence would you use to make your argument uh, that they were, or who, who, who has written them? I have to admit that I Googled. Yeah, okay. Um, and and the, the one point that, that I found that was made was that there, there are parentheses in some, um, in some of the scripture where Moses could not have said that. Right. Because he's either dead or, you know, we, you come across that in a couple places in Numbers when it talks about houses or it talks about fortified cities. It talks about the land, um, but they haven't got the land yet. And Moses isn't entering the land because God said, no, you're, you will get to the Mariba and the striking of the rock in a second. Um, but, yeah, we know that there's some things that, there's no way Moses could have said, right? So it's got to be a mixture of, uh, of the groups. But um, You guys had the benefit of reading Exodus. Now you read Numbers. What are some similarities or differences between the complaints and the whining? Because <laughs> I, I often joke this could be called the book of whining <laughs> instead of the book of Numbers. Take a number. <laughs> Stand in line and take a number. Um, anybody notice any differences or anything that stood out from that? It's just in general, I see them both uh, all worrying about um, uh, their lifestyle. And, and 
I don't have enough food, I don't have enough this, I don't have enough that. And they don't, it doesn't change. And I just say that's human nature. They worry about those things. Sure. You know. Yeah. And they're not illegitimate worries. I mean, no. they need food and water, yeah, right? I, mean, uh, I think I would be a little concerned. <laughs> yeah. We have some uh, new layers on Moses' dynamic with Aaron and his sister, mm -hmm. Miriam. Mm -hmm. there, were there some things you discovered there that you did not know or that were new to you? Because in Exodus we have God telling Moses that uh, you can take Aaron with you. He'll be the person who speaks on your behalf. We also have the golden calf where Aaron leads the people uh, astray, has some, you know, fashions the calf while Abraham, and they have that dispute. But we hear, this, here we discover that people are grumbling against both of their leadership, and then Miriam and Aaron uh, have twofold. They're grumbling against Moses and the fact that he married, I don't know if you picked this up, a Cushite woman, so an African woman who is not an Israelite, mixed marriage, and that's a problem for them, a family problem. We got a family problem with who he's marrying. I don't know if any of you have any brothers or sisters or family dynamics where somebody has an issue with who somebody marries into the family. Not that that ever happens today. <laughs> but uh, it appears we have a big problem, and God has a problem with them, kind of bad mouth in Moses, and, you know, Miriam gets the leprosy, and gets put out of camp and Moses pleads on her behalf. But that's not in Exodus at all, right? That dynamic isn't in Exodus at all. Now, why was only Miriam punished? <sighs> you know, is she, that's a great question. Uh, that's a great question. Let me come back Miriam to that. Miriam gets away with a lot. <laughs> 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 I was like, wait a minute. Is she the baby brother? Is she the younger brother? <laughs> Dad liked you best. <laughs> that's a great question. I'm going to see what the rabbis say about that because I don't know. I mean, was Mary, Miriam instigating it? Because they're I both doing it. it. But they're both but doing they both it. Complain. Yeah, they're both involved. So, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't have anything, right? She's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have some texts about leadership that are important to go along with Miriam. And so let's turn into Book of Numbers. Let's go to Numbers 11. And if we'll, we'll look at verses 10 through 25 here. <clears throat> I find this really interesting. So I'm going to read a little bit of this and then uh, we'll talk about it. Numbers 11, 10 through 25, really. And Moses heard the people weeping through their families, all the entrances of their tents. <clears throat> and the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all these people? <laughs> Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child? What an analogy here, right? So to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors. So a whole lot of finger pointing to God here. Where am I to, and listen to this, verse 13, where am I to get the meat to give to all this people? Does that sound like anything else you've heard in Scripture? All right, what is, comes to mind when you hear that? Yeah. Loaves and fishes. Yeah. Yeah. So Moses is kind of uh, pulled, you know, he's got his, uh, his ego has grown quite a bit, it seems, from this uh, conversation with God. It's all on me. Yeah. Somehow he found his voice, right? Yeah. Now it's all, now these people are upset with me. Now, why am I going to feed these people? Why'd you, you know, put this people on me? So a lot of blame on God, not a whole lot of trust in God, or asking God, but a whole lot of blame. <laughs> you know, why'd you, sounds like Adam and Eve again. You know, why did you, you gave me this woman? Well, you put me in this garden with this snake. And All right. <laughs> they came to me saying, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. They're too heavy for me. 
If this is the way you're going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have found favor in your sight, then do not let me see my do not let me see my misery. So, you know, Moses is kind of at God's complaint desk. And what does God say, basically? Um, you're trying to do too much on your own. We would call this in the modern time over-functioning. You are over-functioning. You need to share leadership. Delegate. Empower. Choose 70 elders to help you because there's no way you can manage this all on your own. You, and, and I think this is an important thing in leadership, whatever we're involved in, but not only are you burnt out, Moses, <laughs> but you're not effective in leading this people like this. Wasn't this, didn't this already happen? His father-in-law. It was his father-in-law in, father in Exodus. In Exodus. In Exodus. Yeah, in, in Exodus, it's Jethro, his father-in-law, who says, hey, <laughs> this is a bad idea. You, you're not doing such a bang-up job. And so find 70 people. Yeah, it is Jethro's advice to him in Exodus. Yeah, a lot of those stories are going to be repeated but told a little differently. Um, but this is an important one because I think we tend to, um, I tend to overfunction. Um, but a lot of us, is, particularly in our culture, you know, you're defined by your work, by your achievements. And... It's very egocentric a lot of times. We do, do a lot of I language, me language. And this is saying, no, this, if it takes a whole village to run a whole people. And I, so I think that's a good model for leadership here that we see in the book of uh, I also think it's a, a really numbers. beautiful thing and important thing to look at that Moses could have this conversation with God. He had to. Trust God, have faith enough in God that he could really go at it with God. Yeah. You know? And um, that this is not a, a God that we need to fear so much as we need to work things out with. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that's, a, that's a good message in the Old Testament that is sometimes really yeah. difficult to swallow. You see it with Abram. You see it yeah. with Moses. You see it with Hagar. Yeah. You see it with Job. Uh, people who are not afraid. Uh, Prophet Elijah. We're not afraid to say, hey, this is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling like I got hit by a truck. You, I feel like you, you put me in a tough situation. You called me to do this. I'm trying to do this, and it's not working. I'm failing. I'm going down in flames here. Now, Moses and, and many others say, well, I, I'd just rather die. The prophet Jonah, same way. You know, you just put me out to these people. Just let me die already. I don't want you to have mercy on them. Um, fun book. We'll get to it. But, uh, yeah, it, 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 uh, thank you for that, Karen. Yeah, it's like God, isn't, God doesn't fire Moses for exposing his failures and his frustrations. God helps Moses walk to a solution in a different place of being that's healthier for him and the people. But doesn't he kind of get the short end of the stick in the very near, you know, right after this? Because it's like, okay, you want meat? Here, eat it until it comes out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite verses in, in Numbers. <laughs> With all those animals that they sacrificed, they had no <coughs> How does that work? <laughs> and then down the road, um, with the waters, it's yeah. like he gets the uh, technicality where he, he uses the, the staff instead of just speaking to the rock. And, oh, well, let's, yeah, we'll talk, let's take the quails first, and then we'll take the, the rock, because I think they're, they're different in a, in, in a pointed way. But the quail, yeah, so we're at, we're at 11 with the quail. So since we're at the quail, yeah, we, ha I'm, we have, you know, they, they're crying for meat. Um, God says, you want meat? I'll give you meat. And sends his quail um, so that it'll be, yeah, coming out your nose. <laughs> it's it's kind of like the, yeah, gosh, uh, you're going to complain, you're going to whine. I'll give you what you're asking for, but you be careful what you ask me for because I'm... <laughs> give you more than you can handle. Uh, well, I'm going to give you more than you bargained for, perhaps. Um, Doing the, the downside of that approach is that then you still have to store things and deal with them. And yeah, I... It's... Yeah, it's... Um, 
it's again, I think, kind of the lack of trust uh, that the people are having. That uh, their first reaction is to complain against Moses and against God instead of asking God or praying to God. Their first mode is, you know, that, that take us back to Egypt. Take us, take us back. You know, we don't. I thought of it before, but it's kind of interesting ju juxtaposition with Moses crying out to God and just really laying it on that he's overworked and he can't do all of this and and yet the people just keep complaining 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 they're not really in a in a conversation with God they're booming at God where and then Moses gets a decent result and they get their faces smashed <laughs> have some more meat you want more meat have some yeah more meat. I mean this is not a good analogy, but it reminds me of like a, a petulant child who won't eat their vegetables and, you know, just won't eat. Um, and like, all right, well, you know, this is what's for dinner. <laughs> um, but, and eventually, if they're hungry enough, they're going to eat. <laughs> but it is this test of wills, like human, I, uh, I want to be in charge, I want, I want things the way I want them. And and when they're not exactly as I want them, there's just a lot of, <laughs> there's, I mean, it, it's really, I think it's not, it is comical. I, I just have to say it's comical, I think, the way that Numbers depicts the people's complaining and whining and God's patience, lack of patience, fed upness, Moses is fed up. Just the tension and frustration between the people with each other, with Moses, with God. It's very, it's a very human book. I mean, it's very, I think it's very point on how we kind of deal with each other. The, the reason why I said that the, the water, though, is different. And it's different than the Exodus story. All right, let's see, is that 20? The striking of the rock. Uh, it's 20, okay, yeah. So Numbers adds a layer to this text that Exodus does not have. Um, let's, let's take a moment to compare the two, if, uh, if you would like. So um, here's what we have in this Numbers 20. We're going to read through it briefly. The Israelites, a whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. So we have one traumatic event for the people because she's a strong leader for the people. And then now there's no water for the congregation. So they gathered against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we have died in our, with our kindred had died before the Lord. Why have you brought this assembly of the Lord into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you brought us out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? It's no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went away from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting, fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff, assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron, and command the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Here's the difference in the text. God tells them, to go out and speak to the rock to in front of the people to wield water so that the people will see that it's not Aaron and Moses. It's God answering their complaints. What Moses does is strikes the rock so that the water comes out so it looks like what? Jesus. Moses has gotten us water. Why do you think God would ask him to do that that way instead of what he does? And then why do you think God's so angry with Moses? Moses disobeyed. One, he disobeys. And he tried to steal his thunder. Took the credit. Right. Well, <laughs> and how many times do we read, by this they will know that I am their God and they will be my people, you know? Yeah, the people's complaint is with Moses and Aaron and their leadership in bringing them to the wilderness. They haven't, 
They haven't talked really about God and their complaints. It's all you guys. You guys have brought us out here. Well, no. God brought you out here. And if Moses strikes it with his staff, then he is perpetuating the narrative that it is by his hands the people are helped and by his hands and leadership that they're provided for. And underneath this text I read, hey Moses, that's, that's the problem. You're not trusting me. You're not visibly trusting me in front of the people. So why would the people come to me if, if as leaders you're saying it's all me? Um, you know, I think about, you know, some cult of personalities sometimes in a church. You have a pastor who's writing all the books and, you know, got their own line. And, you know, uh, if it becomes more of a singular person's church or a singular person's efforts and God is lost in the mix, then that's a failure of reflection of what is the power of a place and a people. And that's why God is upset with Moses. That's why God tells Moses, hey, you're not... You're not fit to lead these people into the promise because you haven't trusted me. And Exodus, it's more ambivalent. It, it doesn't say that that's how. It says the water, um, if we can find it. I don't have my parallel. I should have brought my other Bible that throws the <coughs> parallel in there. Hold on. Let's see if it throws an Exodus parallel. Does anybody have a Bible that says real quickly the reference to this in Exodus? So we can pop it up real quick. All right. Let me see here. Uh, nuts. I should have looked at that. 14, maybe? Exodus 14? Okay, let's check and it out. Also 17, so All right, let's check them out. Yeah, That's 17, 17. 17. All right. Yeah, so here's how Exodus reads. All right, the people, the people quarreled, verse 2, with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? All right, so here's a little different. You're putting God to the test, Moses says. The people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They're ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people. Take some of the elders. Take in your hand the staff which, with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you at the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and the water will come out of it. So the people may drink. So here it says God commands them to do it. But Numbers, it sounds to me like Numbers is saying that's not what really, it's not, well, it's not sounds like it. Numbers tells them to speak to the rock mm -hmm. and that the water's going to come forth. So Exodus actually kind of reaffirms that he's supposed to strike it. But that's not what God says in Numbers. So you actually have two different accounts of what Moses is supposed to do. And in Numbers, that's, that is the reason why he can't enter the Promised Land, whether, whereas here, you don't see that. So that was the same rock incident? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, maybe Moses drove the one where he was told to strike the rock. <laughs> 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 the other one, there you go. Yeah, but I mean, see how you have two different texts and two very different instructions of God. Um, and, and two different ways that, that event is interpreted later. Because for Numbers, that is the reason that Moses dies before they go into the Promised Land. Um, so, and you get no sense of that from Exodus. But anyway. Um, let's get in. Uh, Kathy brought up some of the quirkies. Mm -hmm. Let's get into a little bit of, so we've got, we've got the woman, the test for infidelity in Numbers 5. The drinking of the dust. Mm -hmm. Let's start with that one, uh, if you want. Is that? Uh, so the question is, did any woman survive the drinking of it? <laughs> so well, right? yeah, just dusty water. It's dusty water. Um, so let me, let me. How many? Let me ask the ladies here for a fair representation. How? What is your reaction to this test? When you read it, what did you think? What were your just unadulterated thoughts about this test? I thought it was just dust and it would be fine, so prove you right. I didn't, I didn't. So you thought it wasn't a bad thing? 
Okay. Because nobody's going to die from nobody's going to die from it. I thought they mentioned something else that they put in the water, but I don't. But it could yeah. have been a word I just didn't understand that meant dust. I don't know. Um, it was. I was. I was struck by even if he just suspects. <laughs> yeah. And then I wondered, was this really something that was a dust? Okay, so you thought it was more heavily unfair to the lady. I, oh, definitely. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like. Okay. I wasn't. I wasn't sure exactly what her dust really was. Right. Okay. I mean, what is what is it? Are they giving you something that's going to make you sick? So okay. Let me uh, pass you some other possibilities. So the Babylonians had a law for <laughs> testing an unfaithful wife, and that was to throw her in a raging river. <laughs> and if she didn't survive the rapids, then she was guilty. But if she did, then she's okay, and you can take her back. A lot less, <laughs> a lot more possibility you're going to die in that one than the Jewish version. Now, the, the dust... So this is the only law in the Bible where human beings aren't the judge of a legal matter. The only one. Husband says, I think my wife's been sleeping around and I'm not sure, but I think she's committed adultery. Husband's word is not enough. Got to take her to the priest. Priest says, well, I know this lady and maybe she's, you know, or, uh, yeah, I know this lady, she's respectable, there's no way she did this. Priest's word, not enough. The only way that this woman's guilt or innocence is determined is by taking some dust, which should be harmless, on the floor of the temple mixed with some hyssop and water, so nothing poisonous. Hyssop is uh, purity. Uh, it's supposed to be for health. Um, they give it to Jesus, try to get Jesus to drink it and his last moments. Uh, I think it's hyssop. Let's see. Maybe I'm wrong. Nope, I might be getting this wrong. No, I'm getting this wrong. Sorry? Mm. Sorry, there's no hyssop involved. It's, it's, it's water and dust. It's just water and dust. No hyssop. Okay, so it's just water and dust. So, the odds of her having something bad happen unless this is a really dirty floor, are not very strong. The idea is that God is the only one who knows in this situation whether she's guilty or not. And ultimately, God's the only one who's going to, if she loses a pregnancy or her womb is somehow affected. But believe it or not, this was sought to be a more empowering law for a woman falsely accused than something overly harsh. Because remember, women are technically property of the guy. He could say three times, I divorce you, hand her a piece of paper, and she's got to leave. And her economic stability, her family line are gone. She has to go back to her other family or figure something out, but she's on her own. And this is one of the only places where it's not word of mouth, it's not two male witnesses, it is just God, her, and the drink, and that's it. So compared to other Middle Eastern marital laws, this is pretty empowering, actually, or pretty, I shouldn't say empowering, I should say it's a defensive law for the woman, even though it seems, I think, pretty barbaric to us today, or pretty crazy to us today. At that time, it wasn't comparatively to other laws. So that's just one thing. So the woman caught in adultery with Jesus, and he, he bends down and he writes in the dust, but we never know what that's going to be. Yes. Would the, the <coughs> guys that wanted her, you know, convicted and all of that, and he says, throw the first stone, as Jesus is, is in the dust, would that reflect back to them this story? It's a great question. I mean, it's definitely a trap. Uh, I know we're going off script here a little bit. That's a good uh, tie-in. According to Leviticus, if a woman was caught in adultery, or a man, actually, but it's labeled as a woman, 
You had to have what? Two witnesses. So the guys who bring her have seen her in the act, then where's the guy? Because both of them, according to the law, are to be stoned. But he's not there. And there's a whole group of these men. So they've chosen one and not the other. Which right away just says this isn't fair. This isn't right what you're doing. This is, you are... <laughs> You are playing at games here on uh, this woman's sin, and there's somebody else behind this. And clearly, you've set this woman up because the guy is not involved. Maybe he's one of the guys who's ready to stone her. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think there is some tie in to the. Um, there, I mean, that crowd was willing to have this woman die, and Jesus is not. So, yeah, I think there's something to that here. I don't know. It's, yeah. it's strange. There was a show I just, I think it was, um, I think I was watching with my wife, what was it, what's it called, uh, Handmaid's Tale? Um, I think they did this. And I think they did this, though. I think yeah. they replayed this literally in the show. I'm, it might have been a different show. But I saw this, and I'm like, holy cow, they're <laughs> doing something on numbers. This is crazy um but anyway you have this you have the daughters of zelophad mm -hmm. who say listen we have no male relatives we should own this property and moses and the elders talk about it and say what are we going to do i mean we can't and they say as long as you marry into your tribe because everything and I, you know i think we kind of miss this in we think about gender roles and patriarchy and women's rights, and we sometimes we miss that in this culture, everything is about the land. If 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 this lady, for example, with the if she's had a child that's not the husband's, the the graveness of the sin is not just that she was unfaithful to him as a husband but that this child who is not his will not be able to carry on the line legitimately to, to the land that God has promised. And so the tribal land will be in jeopardy. The family land will be in jeopardy. Their economic status will be in jeopardy. So it's, that's why it's such a bigger, it's a big deal. All these sexual laws are around being able to maintain that line and that promise that God has given you this land be fruitful and multiply, and the land will be blessed. You know, do well, and, and that kind of thing. So, the land is a big deal. That's why you also have, on the flip side, all the laws about gleaning the fields for the poor, uh, for the widow, for the foreigner. And I know it's kind of understated, but there is so much in there about the foreigner treating the foreigner the same as your citizens, which is pretty crazy because, um, but there, there's that equality in Leviticus and Numbers that doesn't often get talked about much in the modern sense of things. Other questions about that, that uh, weird drink? <laughs> it reminded me of Salem witch trap. Like it just yeah. brought that idea of these <clears throat> bizarre, like totally unconnected, thing that you had to do. That's what came to mind. Exactly. Because it's like a tied up to rocks and throw them in the water and if they yeah, sunk yeah, then they were innocent. Right. But then yeah. drowned. Yeah. yeah and, and notice that unlike the adultery where a woman would be stoned if she had two witnesses against her, the loss is again she loses the baby. She's not killed. Again a punishment for jeopardizing the line and the land. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. Uh, we have Nazarites, you know, the long hair, that's going to come into play with Samson. Mm -hmm. Nazarites aren't to touch anything that's unclean, they're not to drink wine, they're to keep their hair uncut. Um, and if it is cut, then they stop being a Nazarite, right, unless they go through. So that's going to play very heavily in the book of Judges when we come to Samson and Delilah and all this stuff. But, here you have this idea of dedication to a Nazarite child. Um, I want to get to the, some of the other obscure. We got the red heifer. Should we talk about the red heifer? What's going on with the red heifer? 
What is that all about? Did you, how many of you are totally lost with a red heifer? That's okay. I still am a little bit lost. So to, if it makes you feel any better, uh, there's a thing called midrash, and it's where all the rabbis over the centuries discuss and write what things mean in the Torah. All right, and they have their different theories and questions, and all their arguments and debates are recorded in the Midrash. So in the Midrash, if it makes you feel better when you read numbers and you feel like your head's spinning, they said, there are four commands in the Torah that nobody understands. <laughs> the red heifer, <laughs> the scapegoat, the law for a, a brother to marry his brother's widow, because that's not easy to do, and to continue the family line, and then the fourth one was, I wrote it down because I don't remember them all off the top of my head. Oh gosh. Come on, Scott, where'd you put it? Here it is. Uh, not intermingling, intermingling wool and linen garments. Yeah. So the rabbis had real no good answers for those. But basically, a red heifer is, you know, a, a a, a cow with red fur, hair, um, completely red, has to be three years old. Can't ever have a yoke on it. No blemishes. Uh, no work. So that throws down the field, but not impossibly so. And the point of the red heifer was to, if you had come into contact with a corpse, that it, the idea of purity. Anybody in the camp of Israel to get this death, this cursedness, God is a God of life, so to lift the specter of death and unclean, uncleanliness versus life to get that out of the camp. So you sacrifice a red heifer in the temple, burn it, take its ashes out of the camp, and then cleanse the camp by taking it out, much like the scapegoat takes the sins of the camp out. The specter of death and uncleanliness around death out of the camp is basically the red heifer. But uh, I think there's recorded in Jewish history nine times that there's been a sacrifice of a red heifer. So this isn't something that happens very often. Wool and hyssop or something. Hyssop's with this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, again, if the rabbis don't understand, I don't pretend to either. I, this is, uh, it's, it's an obscure law. It's an obscure thing. It doesn't happen very often. That's the best I can give you on that. <laughs> if you feel like I don't know what this means, that's okay. Um, yeah. We are going to see... You know, so Moses sends out the spies. Just a little preview. When leadership goes over to Joshua, when we read the book of Joshua, he's going to send out spies. Water's going to part the Jordan River, just like it did in the... the the Red Sea. And really interestingly, uh, if I forget later, you've all heard the story of Rahab? Mm -hmm. Ever heard Rahab mentioned in Scripture? She's in the town of Jericho. She hangs the scarlet cord out. She is a prostitute. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really interesting because if you read the genealogies uh, later, you'll find that one of the two spies later marries Rahab and they have had a son. Um, so <laughs> I find it interesting. You know, reading between the details of the story. Yeah. Anyway. All right. There's a story underneath that story. And if you need me to explain it later, I can. <laughs> um, all right. Any other things that stood out to you in the book of Numbers? I feel like I'm wandering around here. I'm kind of giving this. Balaam. Oh, Balaam. Yes, the donkey donkey. God changes his mind after he tells him to do something. So, all right. We have... Balaam, who's supposed to be hired by the king of Moab to go curse the people of Israel as they're entering the land. Balaam doesn't want to go. Or, I'm sorry, Balaam goes. Balaam does want to go because he's, he's in it for the money. And God's angel is standing in the roadway. The donkey stops. Balaam keeps cracking the donkey, beating the donkey. The donkey says, hey, why are you doing this? And <laughs> then, basically, Balaam sees this angel, much like later in the book of um, Kings, I believe, the valley of the angels are shown to the people uh, that were previously unseen. But 
Anyway, he sees this angel with a sword in the road, and then he realizes he's been cruel to his donkey. Angel tells him to, you know, these are from God. He goes and blesses the people of Israel three times. Instead of cursing him, the king of Moab's very upset because he's paid him all this money and he's done the opposite of what he's asked him to do. And you had some questions about it. So wh where are your questions revolving because, around? Because Balaam asks God every time, should I go? And he's like, finally he's like, yes, go. And then so he goes and then all of a sudden he's in trouble for going. He's in trouble with God for going? Well, that's when God sends, God sends the angel and yeah. the, the sword. Yeah, well... It's like God changes his mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that as far as why God's upset with him or tells him to stop. Or is it is it that God is, um, you know... Balaam at this point does not actually believe that it's God. He's just, you know, he's a diviner. He's a, he's a medium. He seeks spirits. He's, you know, hired as a magician and these kind of things. And maybe God wants Balaam to know that it is something different than his magic going on. I'm not sure. It's really, I say I don't know because, again, you're going to find out later in, like, the book of Joshua that Balaam is executed by the people uh, for being a diviner, for being a sorcerer. And yet God uses him in this case to bless the people. So it's really strange. It is hard to understand why that happens and then why later he's judged and punished for the very thing that God blesses. That's why I say uh, making sense of that is, I don't have to look on that one because I, I don't, I don't have to see what the Jewish guys say on that one because I have no idea on that one uh, why. Uh, so we'll look a little bit more into Balaam too. I, I was picturing the donkey and Shrek. Yeah. <laughs> donkey! Talking <laughs> donkey. Donkey, yeah. It is, it is unusual. It is an unusual thing. Why does God change God's... I was wondering, um, you did a first and a second census. When did they do a census again? Ah, <laughs> great question. So, the, the only other time a census is taken is by King David. And it's in um, the book of Second Sam, First or Second Samuel. I think it's, it's the end of, I think it's the end of Second Samuel 25. And, um, David, his commander, Joab, tells him not to do it because God later commands, you'll see that God commands them not to take census, to trust in the strength of God and God's power, not in their own numbers and their own military might. But instead, David says, let's take a count so we can determine how many we have to go to war because David's got all these military campaigns going on. And Joab says, you shouldn't do that. We're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to trust God, which is really unusual because Joab is a real, <laughs> he is a bloody guy. He's a, he is a ruthless guy. So for Joab to be David's conscious is something that should have given David a red flag, first of all. But in that census, and this is a really interesting text, and I'm sorry, it's, a, it's a, an aside. Um, let's just add a, do you have a minute? Can we take a peek at it real quick? So, yeah, it's a great question. Tangentially, let's just take a quick peek because it is awesome. So it's 2 Samuel 24. So the reason why I say this is, is really crazy is there's going to be a lot of... This is a place where in the Bible, if you read the Bible as an inerrant literal book, you're going to have a big struggle with this text. This is one I think that is one of the best examples of why inerrancy is difficult. In first or second Samuel here it says that God is upset by uh, David taking a census and um, that God punishes David for this by sending a plague on the people. Um, but in the book of first chronicles same incident, I think it's First Chronicles 21, 
it says that Satan, the devil, made David take a census. So it's not David's fault. It's the devil who tempted him to do it. And in this one, it's uh, God told, God, um, let's see. Says again, the anger of the Lord yeah. Against so you could say, yeah, you could say that it's David and being tempted here by Satan. But the, the chronicler, like, and we'll get into this when we talk Chronicles and Samuel, but the chronicler takes away everything that is a shadow side of King David because he's a royal documenter of the king. He wants the king to look nice. So there's no mention of Bathsheba's affair. There's no mention of his sons rebelling and creating a civil war. There's no mention of David being a bad parent or having a wandering eye or taking a census. It's all something else made this happen. Uh, whereas Samuel the prophet is a lot more direct and saying, hey, this is... So it's the only other time, to answer your question, a very long and roundabout way that a census is taken uh, by a Jewish authority other than the census that we see in the New Testament that Caesar takes in Luke's Gospel. Good question. Other, other thoughts, questions? Um, compared to Leviticus, how did you like numbers? It was a little better. <laughs> Incrementally better? Yeah. You know, in the middle of numbers, yeah. near, near the beginning, it's this priestly blessing, which is what our when I was growing up, what the pastor said for the benediction yes, every, every single Sunday. week. Yeah. Like, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May yeah, the Lord yeah, make his face to shine way. upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance yeah. upon you and give you peace. Yeah, yeah. yeah number six. Yeah, it's a beautiful, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful blessing in numbers. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I thought numbers was more interactive than Leviticus. Leviticus just seemed a, a, a rule, rule after rule after rule. And numbers had a lot of that. Um, it, it seemed to me the two salient pieces for me is that God really wants them to know that, he, that God can be trusted. And, and that is uh, evidenced by their obedience to God. And so when the disobedience happens, the consequences seems to be huge. Um, uh, sometimes I wonder if that can be our... I know God sees all sins the same, but I, sometimes I wonder if that's the most egregious one, if it's our, our inability to give full obedience to this being up here. Even if you look at Balaam and Balak, Balaam being the diviner, but he was being tested all the way through, you know. Um, so there just seemed to be this theme of testing. testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, another thing that I think kind of plays in the numbers is n the people always seem to be looking in the rearview mirror. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And God's telling them to look forward. You know, I have good things in store for you. You just trust me. Um, remind the people. I led them out of Egypt. Remind the people. You guys can't go in the promised land because you're stuck in the past. You haven't taught your children about me. It'll take a new generation to know me and to not have that baggage to be able to actually step into the promise in faith. And so yeah, there's a lot of language about stuckness, about stubbornness, about letting go of the tight clutch of control. And I think in all those ways, Numbers is a really beautiful book because it ask that of us, you know, how much do I let God have the life God's given me and do I trust God or is it, and I, you know, I'm a bumper sticker theology guy, you know, God is my co-pilot I always think is ridiculous because that assumes that you're an equal pilot, you know, you're flying or you're the pilot worse yet and, you know, God's got the second seat. Well, that's probably true of a lot of our lives, but man, um, you know, God is really the one that's supposed to be leading, we're supposed to be listening. And so that's one of the things I love about this book. Strong economic component, too, I think. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> folks got what they needed, you know, in proportion. Some got bigger land because they had bigger tribes. <clears throat> but everything was fair as far as what they, what they needed. Smaller tribes got less. 
but also the flip side was true. If he had a bigger tribe, the expectation for them and their giving was bigger than it was for the for the, the smaller ones, you know, yeah. in, in their in their offerings and anything else they had to do. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so next up is Deuteronomy, your second law. Um, and Pastor Michelle will be leading you on Deuteronomy. Um, and then we also are going to do a switch. So um, I'm going to do Joshua after Deuteronomy, but then we're going to, she's going to teach Ruth. We're going to give you a little break and do Ruth before we do Judges. Um, that's twofold. One, just to give you a little breather, because Ruth is only four chapters, but also because Ruth is Pastor Michelle's favorite book, and Judges is one that she does not like, and it's one that I love. <laughs> so we're going to swap hats, and so that each of us can teach uh, something we're passionate about, but also give you a little bit of break. So, so Deuteronomy, and then we'll see you for Joshua after that. <laughs> 